Okay, Borges, such, as Ed was saying, such happy, happy stories. <laughs> um, let's see, the shape of the sword. So it, I, I mean, my default plan, unless somebody else uh, wants to do something different, which is always, you know, always allowable to ask to do something different, is just to go through them the way they are in the book. And so that would mean starting with the shape of the sword. Um, this sort of story seemed pretty straightforward. And then it was still, it can interpret it in a straightforward way, but there's a little, some weird stuff going on at the very end about identity. Um, so, yeah. I, I thought this is maybe this is a nice passage to begin with on page 70 and the edition I have it's um, like I don't know four or five paragraphs before the end uh, at that moment I understood his cowardice was irreparable I clumsily entreated him to take care of himself and went out this frightened man mortified me as if I were the coward not Vincent Moon whatever one man does it is as if all men did it for that reason, it is not unfair that one disobedience in the garden in a garden should contaminate all humanity. For that reason, it is not unjust that the crucifixion of a single Jew could be sufficient to save it. Perhaps Schopenhauer was right. I am all other men. Any man is all man, men. Shakespeare is in some manner the miserable John Vincent Moon. So I don't know, maybe that's the crux of the story. I'm guessing you all guys uh, recognize the reference to the doctrine of original sin there. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, yeah. I'll, I'll leave that. So, I'll leave, leave that as my opening. So then that kind of, I guess this brings uh, into question. So when he, he reveals, you know, I am John Vincent moon, you know, I've got the, the mark, the, the shape of the sword, you know, um, then is he really John Vincent Moon in the most, you know, literal way? Maybe not. Maybe, maybe, maybe not. Maybe there, that question is kind of intentionally ambiguous because maybe, I mean, but then you have to say, well, then where does the, the shape of the sword come from in his face? You know, uh, it, it, it's kind of strange thinking about this, these uh, like collective identities that, sort of like shift around but yeah i'm not exactly this story is kind of uh it's almost like too straightforward to to be uh to the point where it's kind of confusing because i couldn't really get much of the the symbolic i guess element of it that i think borges was really trying to say so i didn't i actually didn't really like this one very much but yeah it's my opinion. Um, I think if I could, if I could say something that I thought was really interesting that uh, you know came across in the story about identity and about uh, kind of the notion of identity, I think that something is something is going on with this um, this this interchangeability of identity. Yes, maybe the man that's talking is narrating the story, or not narrating, but is recounting the story to the narrator. Perhaps he slashed his own face in some sort of penance or something. Maybe he's not the physical body, John Vincent Moon in the story. I don't know. Maybe he is, you know, whatever. Um, I, I, I saw through the story, there was this, this common element of like, and something that I've been, I've been reading and listening to a lot about, and, and it's the notion of particular identity as opposed to universality, right? And I think that, I think that that's kind of the, I mean, Borges is obsessed with the universal and with the infinite, Right, and so I've been thinking about the notion of universality in the struggle for identity. And I was listening to somebody who said, like, uh, a lot of a lot of um, de like the center left Democrats, especially in America, are very obsessed with the notion of identity in the sense that you know we as as center left Democrats, you know, the the white educated intelligentsia, we are these these pigs, these cultureless you know uh, monsters. And you, the the minority class or the minority ethnicity, 
with your particular identity and your funny dances and your spicy food and whatever. That's great. And we really love you doing that. that isn't that just so beautiful, right? And, and and what happens, what occurs is a subtle racism kind of re-enters the frame where the individual casting down this, like, oh, I'm nothing, ignore me, I'm nothing. You, on the other hand, should have all the fun you want with your, you know, silly, you know, culture. It's like the, there's a joke. There was a joke that was a, like an old Jewish joke that I heard that Derrida actually references. Uh, that's about a, a rich merchant going up to the, going up in the synagogue. He says, oh, Lord, I'm nothing before you. I am nothing. Uh, I'm nothing in the, in the eyes of you. And then uh, a fa another famous rabbi comes and says, oh, I, I, Lord, I'm also nothing. I am, I am also just this nothingness before you. And then a plain, ordinary Jewish man comes up and says, oh, Lord, I as well. I am nothing. I, I am nothing. As, uh, uh, you know, please forgive me. And then the two uh, rich and famous individuals look over to him and say, who? Who, who is this guy coming over and saying he's nothing? What do you mean? Well, what, I'm nothing. This guy thinks he's nothing. Come on. What? I, I worked really hard to get to be nothing. <laughs> and, and the idea is that, is that this penance, this self-flagellation of the identity, this, this renunciation of identity puts the individual in a position of universality. And there was some theory, I forget who, who wrote about it, but there was some, some theorist in a crit critique of American democracy back in the 80s who was writing like, Yes, we should have particular identities, right? But there should be a universal framework that establishes them all. And that should be liberal democratic legislature. That's the best we can do, sort of a Fukuyama's dream. Right? Liberal democratic law should hold all of these particular identities inside of it, right? And, and I think that's a catastrophic idea, but I think that that's something that's being approached in this particular story, in the shape of the sword, that, that the identities, are falling away or, or, or remaining particular, whatever, under this umbrella, this universal frame of original sin and of, of repetition and of the notion of, of, of shared guilt, you know? Uh, there's this struggle, at least for Vincent Moon, to become universal, to, to say, I'm not, I am Vincent Moon, no you know, no matter what, I, I may or may not have actually done. I am Vincent Moon, and so you should despise me, you know? And that gives this person recounting the story a sort of power over it. And, 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 and it puts the person telling him in the position where he's like, well, I can't really despise you. I can't really blame you for, for what you've done, you know? Because you are renouncing it all and you're maintaining this position of universality, you know, that, that's, that's dictating what, it, and you're admitting that what you did is wrong and whatever. It, it's, it's this, this this story that which I agree with you Chase I guess maybe it's because I misread it or something but it seems like it's just a story of a man this Vincent Moon character uh struggling for his universality right both as a communist trying to go oh I I these these struggles are just economic they're purely economic struggles we're not it's not about and, and he says oh men men can love and hate for a million reasons but he would always reduce it down to these universal things you know, it's just this constant recurring struggle in Vincent Moon's life to be the universal decider, the umbrella, the, the one who lords over the situation and says, I know what's right, or, or I know that I did wrong, and, and therefore, scorn me if you will. But, but there's kind of a, 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 a seedy implication that's like, you would be wrong to do it. But, but by all means, you know, I, I'm guilty as charged, yes, you know. And so, yeah, I, I kind of, I liked the story in the painting of this interesting character, but I, I wasn't like, I, I didn't feel like it made like a, I guess, I guess it was just sort of a character study of a, of a personality. You know, that's what I got out of it, but I don't know. Maybe I'm naive. Definitely so, but. I, I get, you know, a lot of these stories give me the sense of vertigo, which I guess they're supposed to, you know, the, the name of the book sort of tells me that, but you know, especially as Hunter's talking, I start getting this, the, the, that mirror feeling of, you know, this guy, no, that guy, no, that guy, no, this guy. And so, you know, I could, in, I could interpret this story, which I hadn't thought of until Chase and Hunter spoke, as maybe the narrator is not the original Vincent Moon, but that is, actually is the, the guy who was the narrator, but that for, for some reason, that maybe Hunter's getting at, he feels like he needs to now identify with that other guy. Um, and, you know, he could have, 
inflicted that wound on him, on himself. So it just, it's, that's why I say I get this sense of vertigo, this flashing back and forth. And I, I'm not, I'm, you know, I, I maybe that that's probably intentional. And then the other, the other thing is what, when I was reading that paragraph, you know, where he describes original sin, what, for the first time, um, I made this connection with something Sartre says, which is ironic since, you know, Sartre is vehemently, dogmatically atheist. But uh, in that letter on humanism, he says um, that, you know, when, I mean, this is my interpretation of what he's human. There is no universal human essence because there is no God to have created that essence. And so there is no a priori essence that defines what it is to be a human being. But when every human being in his or her action is constructing a kind of identity, and by doing this in a public way, they're holding that identity up before the public and saying, this is a legitimate way to exist as a human being. And so, you know, through every individual, through their action, they are implicitly making a claim, this is a good way to be a human being, because otherwise I wouldn't be acting this way. And so the, each human being is implicitly proposing that this is a universal human essence, because this would be a good way to be a human being. And, and uh, for the, you know, and I, I grew up Southern Baptist, and so I was steeped in the doctrine of original sin. But for the first time, it seemed like that doctrine and Sartre's Sartre's, Sartre's, whatever, his claim sort of came together in that every individual is the universal in some way, um, whether you assume that God creates a universal and then it is corrupted, as in the doctrine of original sin, or whether each one of us proposes a universal, but then each one of us is a flawed human being. And so whatever model I propose as a human identity is necessarily going to have deeply flawed features to it. So it's like there is no, there is no uh, perfect human essence that we could see because the one we got from Christianity is flawed. The one I present is flawed. So, so anyway, those sorts of thoughts, you know, bouncing off Hunter and, and, and Chase thinking that maybe the identity of these two people is, is more ambiguous than I originally thought. Um, I guess sort of tacking on to that. Uh, so this, when I first read it, specifically the, the passage that you uh, pointed out, initially Nevitt, I thought of this, uh, apparently it's a Tolstoy quote. Um, if I think if I got this right, yeah. Uh, Men are like rivers. Um, the water is the same in each and alike in all, but every river is narrow. Here is more rapid, uh, or is more rapid there, here's slower, here broader now, right? And I, I saw like an unpacking of this a while ago that was sort of just talking about, um, you know, if you're thinking about humans as having like static intrinsic personalities, this is, this is kind of a, a counter argument to that that says, well, what there really is, is this range of capacities that every human being has. And we kind of chart a course through those capacities. But to say that like anyone is intrinsically brave, well, bravery is a human capacity. If your river happens to demonstrate this capacity for bravery, and that we could say that well that's reflective of you but it can also be not reflective of you at different moments just as if, you know a river can be wide at one place and then narrow at another place um and it's interesting because I I, it, I think I remember this being talked about in in the context of existentialism so it's it's interesting to see that uh kind of reappear in Sartre although your your interpretation of Sartre I, I mean I I you know that humanism seems very much more positive and it seems very like very Kantian to me, right? Like there's the sensation of like, oh yes, here is the kingdom of ends. And right, you're, you're sort of proposing what a perfectly just person living in the kingdom of ends would look like based on the way that you live your life. That essay has a very Kantian feel to it, I think. That's fair. I, I don't think I've ever read it all. And I, 
I have like a weird beef with Sart, so that it might just be that. And I have a weird beef with humanism too. So those are like it's it's got two strikes against it just from the get go. Um, the the other thing I was gonna like just in terms of like my personal reception of this, um, I I really enjoyed it, but it was definitely because I I like found myself identifying with Vincent Moon um, in a way that I really did not like. <laughs> I was like, oh my god. You know, um, I mean, just right in terms of thinking about current events, it's just sort of like, oh, it feels like the revolution is happening and I'm just, I'm just sitting in some place like Vincent Moon, you know, being sick or pretending to be sick and not really participating in anything. Um, and, and one, another thing that this story in particular made me think of um, is this conception of sort of negative, I forget what the phrasing is exactly, but basically negative empathy or like toxic empathy, if you guys have ever heard of that before. Um, so the idea is, is that, um, um, oh God, I'm going to have to look up the specifics of, to give you guys a little bit better information. But um, the example for this that I originally saw was uh, related to a school shooting, right? And uh, it was basically about a, um, people who, oh, this was one of those instances where you had a school shooter go in and um, they, what, basically what they did, they went into, I think, a college classroom, ordered all the men out, and then shot all the women in the classroom. This was like, I think, several years ago that this occurred. And what you see in a lot of the men in the situation is that um, they have a kind of like survivor's guilt, right? Like they feel like they should have done something in the moment. Um, in order to try and like stop this person in order to prevent them from carrying out their thing. And it's what the argument was sort of is it's very easy to empathize with that position, right? So if you're a person examining the situation and you're thinking about, oh, well, if I was in that situation, you know, I would have overpowered the person and stolen the gun away. And the truth of the matter is, is like, you know, it's hard to know what's going on in a situation like that. It's, it's hard, to, hard to know that they have the intention of killing everybody. Um, maybe in retrospect, you think, well, maybe it would have, but it, you know, it's right hard to psych yourself up to, you know, sort of be good enough in order to do that in the moment, even, especially if you have an incomplete picture of, of events. Um, and so the argument is something like you, it's possible for you to empathize with a, an individual in a way that is actually incredibly toxic and destructive. And I'm almost thinking, so, so if we go with like what this, I think the simplest reading of the story is, is the person who's telling the story is literally Vincent Moon. Everything in the story happened exactly the way that it was described, except right, he, he tricked us and told it from the perspective of this other person instead of himself. Um, you can almost sort of see him as having, like possibly, you know, empathizing so strongly with the person who took care of them and then he tried to sell out that he's, he sort of has to tell the story from their perspective. Right, like he has such a toxic hatred of himself because he can see himself so vividly through the eyes of this other person and he sees all of these criticisms that he just doesn't have the capacity to move past it. Like he has to tell the story that way. That sort of makes sense. Well, remember at the very beginning of the narration, um, the man who we think is talking about Moon says Moon was in his early 20s. And so, <clears throat> Remember, we talked about uh, some aspect of this, and it's connected to observations of how fixed is a person's personality, and wouldn't we expect a person to change over time, even though we say that it, he or she is the same person? So it seems like there's been a, a fairly large period of time, uh, you know, over 10 years, maybe 20, maybe longer. So he's looking back on his own youth through the eyes of a middle-aged man, right? Because he, he you know, he, he's, he's in a way gently chiding Moon. Oh, he knew the, I'm paraphrasing. He knew the secrets of the universe. His key was dialectical materialism, you know, and he could give you the answers to every single problem, right? And, and it, just, it, just, it just hit me that 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 appears in the other that essay where Borges is talking to his younger self and but you have a so you have a sense of distance the longer you live from what you did when you were younger and and that sense of perspective I think I didn't I agree with you Sean I think this is Moon narrating 
about himself, even though he put it in the in the saying it was this other person talking about the traitor moon. Uh, because I think that he could have a certain sense of distance, but not 100%. Because remember, towards the end of the story, the person who's relating the narration says his hands began to shake. Right, that there was a there was still emotional trauma of him relating the story because I think it's right after he says he took his Judas money, and it was right before, right after that, these that the that the the meta narrator says his hands began to shake. So, um, I, one second point: when you brought up toxic empathy, I thought you were going to go a different way with it, and. Permit me to say this. I don't know if you remember, there was a schizophrenic man uh, some years ago. I don't know if it was 5, 10, it's embarrassing. But he, he took an automatic weapon, went into a movie theater in Colorado and killed a bunch of people. Well, there was a person in the anthrop professor in the anthropology department and bumped into him. And all his empathy went for the schizophrenic. Oh, it's terrible. He's pulling out his hair. You know, he was giving all the symptoms of a schizophrenic person. And I was thinking to myself, well, yeah, I guess I do feel some sorrow for the schizophrenic man, but God damn it, I'm more upset over there's 25 dead people. You know, and, and I just thought, I just think it's interesting where, and I'm not saying my percept, perspective on it is the correct one. But it's interesting to me on where where do people's empathy go, right? What what it, what what where is the empathetic connection, and what does the empathetic connection say about a person's identity? Yeah. So, oh, okay. I think. Oh, sorry. Okay. So I, I think one way to approach this also is a. Uh, you know, you could see it as a kind of this. Uh, basically his actions are so um, against his beliefs to a certain extent, or he can't basically synthesize his own identity with himself in in a real way anymore because of what he's done that, you know, may basically, especially, you know, he's like a dialectical materialist Marxist it goes from that to basically taking Judas money like there's a, a huge gap there between those things. And I think it's that kind of contradiction. You know, it's usually traumatic things that lead people to have a kind of like dissociative personality disorder and things like that. Or even, you know, Ed was talking about schizophrenia, which is literally like a splintered mind. And I think you could see it something like that, that, that he his basically this idea of like his universal beliefs and all these things were so at odds with his actual, you know, being in the world and the things he would actually do that that's where this kind of split happens. And that's how he's, he's kind of, and that's kind of the mirroring effect that he's constantly like going back and forth between trying to understand himself from a kind of objective point of view and then trying to actually identify with himself as that. And that's why I remember, so there's kind of these incongruencies with it, with, uh, so the actual narrator, you know, or Borges in this is basically, he calls them the Englishmen. He's like, no, I'm Irish. And then he still refers to him as the Englishman, which, you know, they're the Irish are fighting, of course. So you get this like mirroring effect also there with this personality thing. So I think that's a really interesting way to see it. And then I kind of have another theory that would then kind of go with the, uh, more the thing that it's kind of like almost like a sort of like a mystical identification of the universal, you know, shadow or, or something like that. But I'm just going to, I'm not really, actually, I just lost interest in that perspective. So I'm just going to leave it at that. Well, well, if, if you'll permit me, I, you were talking, 
I, I don't remember your phrase because you instantly dropped it, but if you look at a number of Borges' stories and essays, there is something about uh, the double or people being connected by identity, uh, disconnected by identity. Um, I mean, think of the very strong connection uh, between the um, Chinese spy and, and was it Arnold? Uh, the, the sinologist. Uh, I mean, he had one of the most intense personal conversations about his ancestor in his entire life. And yet it's because he was there to kill him. You know, so you have these weird relationships that seem to uh, replicate themselves in, in so many of, of Borges' uh, essays and short stories. Th th these relationships are fraught with danger. That idea that Chase brought up uh, was a new one for me in this story. Um, but that, it seems plausible. Um, I, I'm thinking of, you know, Nietzsche, talked about this sort of proto-Freudian proto notion that um, each of us is constituted by a, well, ultimately wills to power, but let's say a, uh, a, a mutually, a set of drives and instincts and feelings and, and so on that in general are not coherent and they tend to, you know, be in conflict with one another. And he, he describes a man, a person and beyond good and evil that just wants this war to be over. So there's, there's like two different kinds of people. There's one, you know, there's two kinds of people, those that divide people into two kinds and those that don't. There's, <laughs> there's two kinds of people, um, those who find this inner struggle to be a, a um, incitement to life and those who find this inner struggle to be exhausting and depleting. And uh, he just takes it for granted that, well, I don't know if he takes it for granted. I would, I think he would say there's, you know, evidence in people's behavior, but that in the modern era, we are, compo we are composed by these inner struggles and a big part of being able to construct a meaningful life is how we cope with that. And, you know, I, you know, may, maybe I am unusual in this regard. I mean, I, when I've said this before, people look at me like, my God, what kind of monster are you? But in, you know, there are areas in my life where I consistently act counter to what I profess to be my own values. And, you know, I think Sartre would probably say, well, then they're not really your values. I don't know if that's right or not, but, um, you know, but, I, and it, and it does create, you know, tremendous tensions in my, in my mind. And so, you know, may, that seems at least a, a plausible possibility that, uh, you know, I, I guess we, we don't probably have to reduce this story or any of these stories to a single stream or a single set of meanings, but that seems to be at least a, a plausible feature of what's going on here is you have a man who's, who has performed an action that is so opposed to, to what he wants to be his own values that it just sort of unseats his, his sense of self. Um, and, you know, he's no longer able to maintain that steady, coherent sense of identity. So, um, one thing I think is interesting about this, you know, with the, the whole doubling of identity and, and the repetitions and all these things, is that also ties in with, you know, like Ed was saying, a lot of the other stories, especially in the one uh, right after this, the, uh, oh, what is it? I just, I'm blanking. The traitor and hero. Yeah, yeah, that one. So that one is kind of like a repetition of history in a way that, but it's also, you know, like fiction coming into, into history. But essentially there's this idea of these cycles of time and things like that. I, I think it's kind of the same thing here possibly with, with this whole notion 
of identity as kind of uh, as sort of these repetitions. But, um, you know, I don't really know exactly where I was going with that. I thought I had something. Um, you know, I'm, I'm just going to, I'm just going to open it up right there. So that was disappointing. <laughs> no, I, I, I actually, I think, um, the, the two things come to mind. First off, uh, like, it seems like you're describing and like, you're, you're making me think now, weirdly for the first time, uh, about that the, these story. Yeah. <laughs> just in general, that's the first time I've thought on now. Uh, the, it seems like the stories in Labyrinth are reminding, you know, the Buddhist concept of samsara? the the wheel the eternal wheel of, of resurrection and, and suffering you know that is, is attempted to be broken out of and and i think that if we go with that line of reasoning i i just to shake things up a little bit i like to imagine what if perhaps vincent moon is the hero perhaps vincent moon is the is the is the one true hero of this story that he's he's attempting here with this radical break to 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 escape the samsara you know, to uh, to abandon this this repetitive sort of uh, falling into these traps of attempting at universality, and is now attempting to jump out of that and find real universality, like a Hegelian universality, in his particularity, in accepting his particularity by moving away and being alone and saying, "I am Vincent Moon," and all this. You know what I mean? Yeah. So. So it's almost like he's trying to kind of uh, make up for his bad karma, but he's, he's a hero in the sense that he's kind of broken away from that, the tendency of his previous personality, which led to ultimately, you know, his betrayal of the, whoever this other person is and to, you know, the scar on his face. And that kind of marked this period of transition and then he's the hero because he's made that transition, but he's kind of had to do it by this kind of like rupture of his personality into a, a really adjacent uh, direction. So I see that's interesting. I would, I would, it would connect with, you know, some kind of an Eastern idea about, you know, samsara and, and karma and all these things, but also notions of, you know, once again, that kind of like multiplicity of personality and also with repetition that basically what he's doing is he's trying to break away from the repetition of, you know, his previous uh, personality in a sense, because it makes it sound like, so the, the way that the narrator describes him at the beginning is totally different from how he describes, you know, John Vincent Moon. He talks about it as like, you know, this really hard worker guy who's, you know, like, he seems like pretty stoic or whatnot. And then he seems totally different from how John Vincent Moon is talked about. So once again, there's that kind of like mirroring or doubling of a complete shift there. So yeah, that's an interesting perspective. I would definitely say not to be like a, I don't know, a conservative polycan thumper. I, what's the, what's the equivalent of a, What's the equivalent of a Bible thumper in a Buddhist context? But uh, I, I, I don't think any Buddhist would go along with the, that interpretation. I, I mean, for one thing, I think that Vincent Moon, right, or, or the narrator, or whatever, how, you know, however we want to talk about this guy, um, he, he pretty clearly has like an, a negative attitude towards this prior version of himself um, and is, is pretty invested in a critique of him. Um, and then you see like the intense emotionality, like if he's literally shaking by the end of this, of telling the story, I, you know, I think what a Buddhist would say is that this is, this is like intense negative identification effectively. Um, this isn't because, right, if you're going to transcend an aspect of your personality, you would need to be, you would need to accept it. You would need to accept that that's a part of yourself. And that's right. I mean, just in terms of like, if we're going back to the hypothesis I presented earlier on that he needs to tell the story this way because he has he, he needs to not conceive of himself as the character uh, of, of Vincent, Vincent Moon, even though he knows that's who he is, right? Well, that inability to accept that is, a, you're right, you're, you're deep in samsara. That, like that's, you're, you've really fucked up. <laughs> like, let's be clear about this. Um, uh, and and, and in, even in terms of like, I think the story, I, you know, it's pretty easy for me to identify, you know, 
I mean, it sort of suggested at the beginning, you know, that uh, we got this land and the landowner didn't initially want to want to sell it to him. Um, you know, and the idea is, it, you know, it's kind of suggested like, oh, we don't quite know what he did to get the landowner to sell it to him. So kind of, you know, kind of makes it sound like he maybe threatened him, right? Or at the very least intimidated in, uh, him into actually selling him the land. So it kind of seems as though what's going on here is he's, he's putting up a, a very stoical, um, a very crude, a very brutish and, and, and a potentially very violent front um, towards, towards the world, towards the people around him. He has, right, he's developing this sort of reputation. Um, you know, his, the fact that he, um, you know, is going to insistently identify as an Irishman, even though, right, that clearly is very much at odds with his, with his personality, uh, or in, and not with his personality, but with, like, with the actions that he did, right? Like, can you really consider yourself an Irishman if you, if you sold out your fellow brother to the, to the, to the British? And then, you know, and he tells the story, he's very explicit about this, tells the story in, like, part English, part uh, like Brazilian Portuguese and part Spanish, right? So his identity is all over the place in terms of um, where his, his like string together of just the vocabulary of what's occurring. Um, so, I mean, I, you know, I think that that was an interesting interpretation, but I, I think that um, uh, it has some problems. Uh, I, I think even from a Hegelian perspective, right? Like it, this is clearly a guy who's in, invested not in a synthesis, but in an antithesis. Yeah. You I, destroyed our theory. No, no. Well, I, I was go, thinking back to to uh, Nevitz, uh, how he kicked off this story uh, when he quoted that, you know, at that moment, I understood that his cowardice was irre irreparable, irreparable. I clumsily entreated him. Uh, whatever one man does, it's just, as all man did it. I mean, to me, this is. And that whole thing about disobedience in the garden and a single Jew sufficient to save save us. I mean, to me, th this is one of the more Catholic stories of Borges's. Uh, and I and I and I think that Moon is. I mean, the the character Borges is Moon's father confessor. He needs to tell somebody the whole story because he did betray you know, a person and he betrayed a cause and he betrayed what he said he was about. And doesn't he have the money to buy this land because of that betrayal? You know, and so that's the very means, the financial means of him being able to be this landowner. And so to me, th this is um, a person who is saying, I have committed the worst type of sin uh, possible. I, I betrayed, I betrayed a friend. I betrayed a, 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 uh, another human being, but wrapped up in that is betraying a cause, a whole set of beliefs. And usually when we, when we see, uh, when we see stories about betrayal is do you betray a friend or do you betray an ideology or, you know, are you a patriot or are you a friend? But this is a double kick in the groin. I mean, he betrayed both a friend and a cause and supposedly of, of what he was about. So to me, um, yeah, there's, this is an odd story for me, for Borges, because I think he's really comes down on Moon, Moon really committing the sin, very serious sin. He yeah, I, I think that um, like I get a lot of I get a lot of imagery throughout the story. Like you're saying, like you you actually made a very great point that the money that he got from the the sin was what he used to to, to find this new life. It's almost like, and this you know perhaps if I could I guess you know reconcile with Sean's very rigorous critique, <laughs> which I, I have to I have to accept and and cope with, uh, and that is that, and I'm going to do that by saying that perhaps. And that's why this story is confusing to me. This story is weird. This is a weird story because it's like, I'm seeing all these elements, these, this, I'm, I'm thinking of this sansara. I'm <clears throat> witnessing these Hegelian inversions. Like when you say that he uses the money from his original sin and he, and he uses it to, to find freedom. That reminds me of the Haitian revolution, which Hegel wrote a lot about, which was the, the notion of the Haitians using the language and the tool and the education that was very sparsely available in order to revolutionize and to free the, the people from French rule. 
uh, French colonial rule. Um, but also, just as a quick aside, and I just because I just remembered it, uh, you know, guys know Elaine Baidu. He says that betrayal is one of like the only immoral things that like we could, betrayal and a couple other things. He's a very categorical guy. He's, but like, uh, I think it's interesting that like Moon is like it's like he's attempting to exit the samsara. He's in, he's attempting at this Hegelian universality. He's making these these leaps towards it. By, by attempting to figure out dialectical materialism and then abandoning it with reconciliation with this notion that, that, that it, a, a man could love or hate for a million reasons or whatever, because he's the one saying that. You know, he's, he's attempting to reconcile and he's just falling into this self-hatred and this, and this uh, well, I guess, uh, hopefully not another cycle, but perhaps that's, that's the idea is that he's just going to fall into more. And I don't know if that's like a, it's painting a picture of like, you know, uh, a man attempting to find his universality or break through and find his freedom and falling to the trappings of, of humanity or, or something. But it just seemed it, like, like I guess I said at the beginning, it's like this case study in this, in this just poor, this poor individual who's clearly betrayed somebody, and can't really deal with it, but, but is trying to, to, to deal with it in this weird coping mechanistic way, you know? And then you've just got the narrative. It's just kind of, there, seeing Vincent Moon have this neurotic episode in front of him, and he's like, oh, I don't know. And, and it leaves off there. And, and I guess, and I don't know if that, what the lesson's supposed to be, you know what I mean? Like, I don't know if the moral of the story is that like, oh, watch out for this, you know, don't be like Vincent Moon. Or maybe we're all like Vincent Moon, or uh, you know, something, you know, something like that. You know what I mean? Yeah. Y'all have the potential to be Vincent Moon. <laughs> yeah, I think there is some kind of uh, like universal metaphor going on here. I can't quite tell what it is exactly. I mean, you can think of like, like different Jungian ideas and whatnot, but I'm not really sure. So I'm not going to get into that. But uh, I think, Sean, I think you make some really good points in that basically uh, he isn't really uh, a very swell guy afterwards. He, he's really reactionary and basically he does this 180 flip, but in a way that's actually not very great. But yeah, he's like, so he takes his money, he becomes a landowner, works these people really hard. From a dialectical Marxist materialist, he's basically become, you know, that, that capitalist oppressor or whatever. And, you know, I don't think Boris presents that very sympathetically either, just like he doesn't present Vincent Moon as, you know, coward, dialectical, materialist guy sympathetically either. I think he's saying, like, you know, both are wrong. And it, I think it's because, um, kind of like what Ed was saying with the fact that after he basically did this act, that's basically, you know, the act of betrayal that gave him, you know, the mark, that afterwards was basically that was like the original act of sin for him in the sense that he was never able to get over that and it's basically that it's like you you can't really he can't do anything to kind of redeem himself after that all he can really do is just like the the pieces just fall into place and i think it, yeah i i think um trying to get lessons from Bora's stories is always kind of complex because he's never straightforward. He's always trying to like complicate, you know, getting lessons. But usually there, if there is any kind of lesson, it's basically that kind of complication of these things. And that, you know, it's almost like the lesson of this is to try not to get any kind of like a, a, a a totally, you know, deliberate, sure lesson from it. And, and that's kind of, that's, I guess, sort of what's going on. Yeah, I, I, I think I agree, actually, with that last part. I, I'm just kind of hearing some of the, guy, the, the things you guys are saying about kind of these details, like, and, and I feel like I disagree with some of them, like, like the, the fact that when he, the way he got the fields, for example, uh, it was my understanding that it says that I understand that the Englishman resorted to an unexpected argument. He confided to Cardosa the secret of the scar. 
And, and that gives me the feeling that what, what allowed him to get that, that field and what allowed him to connect to this other person was the scar um, and telling the story of the scar. Uh, it, it, this process of kind of speaking and, and, and explaining and, and even though he kind of runs from it and, and starts it out with saying, you know, like, this wasn't me, it's this process of, I, I think, relating to someone in a way that I think very few people really do. I, I, it's this real honesty. It's this real, like, like, here I am completely kind of contradicting the values that I had and, and having a scar on my head to prove that, you know, so everyone can see this, this, this thing that I did, this terrible, horrible thing that I did. And I don't think he transcended it, but I think in a way he's accepted it. And when people ask him, he doesn't hide it, you know, like Borges just kind of asked him and he told the entire story and, and he finished it. And, and I, I just think, you know, there, there are just a lot of things that, that make me feel like, yeah, that there isn't like a lesson here necessarily, but that, that people have this kind of tendency to see themselves as monsters uh and 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 the scar you know is is i think the perfect the perfect way to 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 put to kind of put this identity of this terrible kind of horrible person that he is uh but in a way i think that by having that scar and by kind of showing everyone that he is this horrible person he can move past it and just kind of live his life. And maybe he's not perfect. I mean, he, he clearly is severe to his workers, but he's apparently just as well, you know? And so there's kind of all these things of like, oh, he's doing this horrible thing, but he's also kind of being reasonable about it, you know? And I think that, that those contradictions, like they'll never be resolved or, or they'll, never be, they're, they'll never be like completely reconciled. But in a way, I think he's accepted them. And, and even though it's painful and even though it's, like really hard for him to kind of explain that and, and present it, he does. And I don't know, I, I think there's a value to that. I'm not exactly sure what that means, but. I mean, so I, that, I like that. Um, one thing I, I do, it's interesting because we've, we've mentioned, right, the Judas story a lot. Um, and right, and maybe some of like, like sort of Catholic tinged elements of this. And I do think it's interesting Right. If if we do a direct comparison, I mean, this is very similar to the Judas story in the sense of like, okay, you sell this guy out, you get the money, um, Judas. So they're like two different versions of this uh, of of what happens to Judas afterwards. I believe in both of them, he goes and he buys some land um, with the money that they're given to him. Oop. Three versions of Judas. Oh, interesting. Yeah. The, yeah. Uh, uh, but um, uh, I think well, the one that's I think most relevant to what I was about to say is um you know he buys this land he goes and he hangs himself on it um and that's how he dies um and i mean okay so so this character right vincent moon goes and he buys this land and he i mean he hasn't you know killed himself on it right he's he's still there um and he's still sort of farming i mean i i guess in one sense i mean right of the low bar of the betrayer goes and kills themselves right i mean he's definitely at least he's out competing Judas in terms of dealing with the action that he took. Um, I mean, like saying that he accepted it, I, I would be interested to hear a little bit more about like why you feel that's the case. I, I definitely did not get that sense from, um, from the story that we're sort of told. I mean, I guess he's accepted it at least in the sense again, that he's, he's still here um, and he's still trying to make some kind of sense of this identification with this person, Vincent Moon and the part that they played in, in this, you know, revolution in Ireland. Um, but I do, I do think it's interesting to think about that, at least in terms of a, um, a question of what is, like, what is he even doing with himself, right? And what, what do any of us do with ourselves when we become disappointed or, you know, outright, you know, contemptuous of ourselves because we're, we, we view ourselves as monsters and, um, uh, or you right, view ourselves as as woefully inadequate to the lofty goals of um, that sort of Sartrean vision of of ourselves, right? Of like this is what this is what a justifiable version of a human life looks like, right? If I if I'm looking back on my life and I'm going like, you know, 
I don't think that's a justifiable action. I don't think that was good. I don't think that's something that, I don't think that's a way another human being should live. I don't think it's the way that this human being should have lived. Um, you know, how do you, how do you handle that? Well, if you look at the very first page of the story, the, the, the Borges says he drank, you know, the moon drank, drank. And sometimes he would lock himself in the second story. And it, it, it seems like he was literally drinking himself multiple days into a stupor because when he would come out of that locked room, he would be, it was described as uh, he was confused. I want to, I want to do justice to it because yeah, they also say that he drank colon a few times a year. He locked himself into an upper room. And I also think that's interesting. You ever hear the phrase upper room? That's where the disciples found Jesus. They were on the second floor. He appeared to them. The door was locked. And he, the transfiguration, he appeared to them, except for Thomas, who I guess was doing his laundry. And that's why he came back and said, well, I don't believe you. I'm going to have to put my, my fingers into his, you know, into the nail holes. But a few times a year, he locked himself into an upper room, not to emerge until two or three days later, as if from a battle, as if from a battle or from vertigo, pale, trembling, confused, and as authoritarian as ever. And I mean, no offense to South America, but if you really, really are making it in Europe at the time Boris is writing, you don't put yourself on a hacienda in the middle of nowhere, Argentina and buy some land. I mean, yes, that's, that's a perfectly decent life. Argentines would love it, but it's, he's exiling himself. I can't imagine given the transportation technologies of the time, you know, you could pretty much go any further than, than, than the interior of South America. Uh, and which means he says he's an Irishman, but he, it's a, it's a self-imposed exile. He's, he's left the land of his birth. He's left everything he knew and what he was a part of. And now he's in this very isolated rural community where he, he, he drinks. And not only that, it's, it's, to me, it's a burden. I think you're right, Sean. It's a burden to him. It's very difficult to live with because that's why he gets just inebriated to the point, you know, that he is he even functional. And then he comes out and he's disoriented and, and then that's good for six months and then he does it again. Uh, yeah, to, to kind of continue on that, I, I think it's hard for me to really uh, explain kind of the way I feel about it, but I, I'm reading another book right now called East of Eden, which has a lot to do with Cain and Abel and, and uh, you know, kind of a lot of these things. And there's a character in it named Charles who has a scar uh, over his over his forehead uh, and I, I can't help but kind of be reminded of him and think about kind of his experience and I've read I've read it back in high school but I don't really remember the way it ends but I know that the book is kind of about redemption and and kind of the the past and familial uh, difficulties kind of transcending them and, and being able to move past them and 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 as you guys were talking i kind of got this feeling that you know the fact that he's exiling himself the fact that he kind of i think i think that he wants to transcend it i think that he has a desire to get past it and to see the scar on his head as something that isn't the worst thing ever like he does he doesn't want to see a monster in himself but he does and I think the fact that Borges is kind of receiving this, you know, like it really surprised me that that uh, the Vincent Moon kind of directly says Borges uh, and 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 defines the the person talking to him as Borges makes me feel like that there's a certain responsibility on Borges uh, to recognize Vincent Moon as not a monster uh, and 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 to see him and the things he's done as as maybe not normal, but, but forgivable, uh, and, and, and something that we can like basically get past. Uh, but I think that there is definitely like, like 
I, I, I have a feeling, you know, and, and going back to the fact that he confided to Cardoso the secret of the scar and then got this land, I have this feeling that everyone he tells the story to is scared of him. Uh, that, that they see him as a monster just as much as he sees himself as a monster. And, and there's this, this chapter in East of Eden where uh, Steinbeck, or, or the narrator, I mean, it's not technically Steinbeck, talks about what it means to be a monster. Uh, and and to, the, to, the, to all the normal people in the world, that monster is a monster. But to other monsters, they see the normalcy as the monstrous quality, you know? And so to be a monster is, is really essentially to only be different, you know? And I think that Vincent Moon sees all these terrible things about him and sees himself as a monster, but in reality, he's just not fitting the expectations of, of this other person around him who sees him as a coward and sees him as, as contradicting the things that, that he's done. And so I think he's kind of forced himself to see himself as, you know, whoever this other person was that he betrayed and, and, and to be able to transcend that and see himself as, as something that, that isn't horrible, you know, it's just, he made a mistake. He, he, he did something terrible, but he can get past that. But I think that the only way he can is, is through however Borges responds. And the fact that we don't know how Borges responds, I think, is an important aspect. It, it leaves kind of the expectation of like us as readers of the story and as people who are listening to a story, we have a certain responsibility, I think, to respect someone and to, to understand their, their perspective, even if it sounds horrible to us. And that maybe respecting them and understanding that perspective is exactly what they need to no longer be a monster. Yeah, I, I, I'm with you in the sense that, like, there is that element of, of kind of forgiveness, right? And, and I think that there's, but there's this, there's this duality to it that is kind of confronting me. Uh, in that <clears throat> there's the, it's, it's like, <clears throat> there's a lot in the story that is trying to, to make us believe, or I guess maybe not make us believe, but to, but to, kind of validate the idea that what he did was wrong, like like the, the, the betrayal thing, betrayal being one of the only immorals or whatever. I, I think that, I think that perhaps, uh, you know what, what comes to mind here with, with this story? It seems to me, the one thing that I can't like let go of is that there's this, this reference to how, to Vincent Moon, it was a Howard Moon as a character in the show, uh, Vincent Moon's uh, progress politically, and and kind of the the consequences of his journey to self discovery that he's in the middle of while he's talking to Borges. You know, he sold out a movement, and he hurt a lot of people. And and a, a person who comes to mind is like Eldridge Cleaver, uh, who has a crazy name, but was a uh, a leader of the Black Panther Party uh, up until the 1960s. Uh, when he joined uh, some like Freedom and Peace Party and then later became a conservative Republican uh, within the following decades and then died. Uh, and Eldridge Cleaver, I feel, reminds me very much of Vincent Moon and vice versa, that there is a, there are real consequences to this, this mistake, to this process of self-growth and, and things that we have to recognize and have to reconcile with. And, and I think that maybe that's the idea is that he's supposed to be just like hard to forgive. It's supposed to be hard to forgive him because they're really, it really is terrible. Like the things he did. And, and in fact, the thing that um, on page 69, there's just a small sentence that I feel uh, made me think about this, that maybe we're supposed to have a hard time forgiving him. 69, it says uh, at the very top of the page, uh, Moon reduced the history of the universe to a sort of economic conflict. He affirmed the revolution was predestined to succeed. <clears throat> I told him, that for a gentleman, only lost causes should be attractive. You know, and, and I, I've heard that before. I, I listened to a lecture recently called In Defense of Lost Causes. And then there's Kant and his whole argument that the only way that you can be ethical is if you don't want to, and you have to be anyway, and you, you know, you begrudgingly do it. it. It seems to me that there's this, this sort of reconciliation going on within the story, not within Vincent Moon's mind, but within the story, 
between the notion that, vi yes, Vincent Moon is deserving of our respect and our sympathy, just like that schizophrenic man that we talked about earlier before we started recording, I think. There is a reason to be sympathetic and to be understanding that this man is not just a monster through and through. But at the same time, it really is hard to forgive him. It's, it's terrible, the things he did. But that difficulty in forgiving him is what makes that forgiveness worth something. It shouldn't be just like, oh, yeah, whatever, you stole you know, a candy bar. I can forgive you, no problem. It, it, it should be kind of a, a turmoil, you know, a sense of struggle within us to, to, to be able to forgive Vincent, you know? And, and I think that, that these very real, very solid, yes, very real, very solid arguments on either side, what well, we should forgive Vincent, what well, we shouldn't forgive Vincent, whatever, they are culminating into this moment where we are not allowed to see what happens. And I think it's kind of up to us to, to sit with this, with this relationship between these two concepts. And maybe there isn't a, a final reconciliation between the two, but there is just this, this antagonism that, that is the reconciliation, you know, that that's as, that's as far as we're allowed to get. That's as deep as we can possibly get with all of our reasoning and all of our philosophies it is that there is a fundamental antagonism that we have to take a stand on, you know, because otherwise this man is either going to live his whole life drinking and shaking uh, and, and being authoritarian, or we're going to let the crimes of political betrayal and, 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 and the, the death of many young, innocent individuals totally go you know, un, unchecked, you know, and, and maybe I just think that that antagonism is where it leaves off in the middle of the conversation between him and Borke. And maybe that's the lesson. Maybe that's the lesson is that there, there is no way to reach that lesson. And we have to be okay with that in some sense, or we have to do something. We have to make our own lesson. You know, we have to decide what's meaningful for us. I don't know. So uh, shall we move, move on? To the okay. next story. Um, I didn't. I'm not. I'm not um, devaluating your your comment, Hunter. I'm just being the. That's what I assumed. I, I assumed that you thought that I was stupid. And like, yeah, because it pretty much sucked. But <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, it's just that the the next story is in some way similar. Yeah. This one and it, it, the the themes that you and Chase and 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 Sean and Travis and everybody else was developing could, could feed into that, I think, really well. Sure. I really, at the end of this story, I got that sense of uh, mirror flashing vertigo even worse than I did in the previous one. Um, you know, I, I begin to think every, that, there, I'm seeing this pattern, a lot of stuff happens at the very end, like in the last couple of pages of these stories. But um, I mean, the, the whole idea of this plot being modeled on these classic, you know, uh, bits of literature was pretty jarring and mind blowing. But then you start thinking about the fact that Nolan himself may have been part of the anticipated story, even though the people, the person who constructed it would not have been around anymore and would have been too gener you know, a generation or two gone. Um, you know, the, so the last paragraph, Ryan suspects that the author interpolated them so that in the future someone might hit upon the truth. He understands that he too forms part of Nolan's plot. But then he just pu publishes a book to the hero's glory because I guess to not screw up the guy's image again. So anyway, that whole, <laughs> that whole, that whole uh, what's that called, recursion and you know, internal self iteration, I found very disorienting. Yeah, I, uh, I don't know. I, I just feel like I'm very attracted to these stories because of that, because the ending uh, kind of just, you know, flips the whole story and kind of gives you this completely different perspective. I, I think just in general and kind of any media, I'm really interested in endings because like, the only thing that we can't reflect on is an ending, I think, you know, is like, in our own lives, like in our own experience, you know, it's like once we die, it's very hard for us to understand like how we could reflect on that and, or, or what that would even look like, you know? So I think there's this kind of, like he, he definitely wants you to feel kind of dissatisfied. 
And, and I like that feeling of dissatisfaction because I think that it, it exists so often in my life that I can relate, relate to it, you know, just, just me trying to do things and trying to create meaning in my life. So many times I think it just ends in this feeling of like, well, that's not what I expected or, or that's not the thing that I wanted to happen. And if, if it was, if, if everything in my life was what I expected, I imagined I would get very bored. <laughs> and, and I, I have this feeling of like, like no, no. Th okay. almost as if Borges is like this, like against kind of like, <laughs> I don't want to say against boredom, but I, I think he, he is willing to accept a lot of things that people will negative to create something interesting and new and unique. And uh, yeah, I don't know. I, I, I value that a lot. I think that, you know, the, the there's never kind of a clear, uh, uh, you know, lesson or anything like that. And I feel like that's fitting. Do you know yeah. the title of the book? I mean, beg your pardon, of the, sh of the story? The, the word and. The theme of the traitor and the hero is, is the man who betrayed the cause but was found out before he could act on it and then agreed to go through everything. Is he both a traitor and a hero at the same time? Yeah. I, I, and I think that they almost kind of switch roles in the story. You know, it's like by the end, you're kind of like a little upset at the, the person who's fabricated all this because it's like, okay, well now the, these people won't know the truth and they've been kind of fooled. And yeah. So I think I agree. I think that that kind of churns, churns around and, and as, as, people who kind of desire truth and to understand, especially in the context of history, you know, at first this guy who's the traitor kind of completely accepts death so that this, this, you know, idea can move forward. So. Yeah, I think they can, they both exist in a kind of superposition in a sense that uh, I think what Boris is trying to do is kind of, deconstruct our either or sense of understanding these things so that instead it's more like a both and so the that we can have essentially kind of a seemingly contradictory qualities kind of co-present within us like a multiple personality in a sense so the i definitely enjoy this feeling of a uh, of vertigo and you know the the shifting ground of reality or uh i love the the saying nevit that you made i think internal self iteration that's that's awesome i love that i wrote that down i'm probably going to use that just so you know i love that uh, just the idea of the the mirrors reflecting each other into an infinite regress and as you look at something, it shifts. Uh, yeah, I, I'm kind of like addicted to this feeling of, of not of kind of my own ignorance in a sense, or it's maybe not just like me personally. I mean, I'm brilliant or whatever, but it's more like these are like the actual conditions of knowledge or, or something like that are inherently shifting and uh that's what that's what i love so much about these stories and i don't know i think about philosophy i guess in general for me at least um this is where i see a lot of similarities with borges and, and phil k dick who uh of course i love and I, one thing i think is interesting is that phil k dick was very into the kind of the shift the ways that fiction kind of shifts into reality and vice versa and i think borges is also equally interested in this where phil k dick had actually happened to him where his basically his fiction kind of came true in his own life where borges is kind of more kind of philosophically talking about this in a, a little more uh intellectual or detached way but 
in here, I think what's really interesting in this story is basically this idea of, you know, in what way is what we think of as fiction or the or imaginary, the stories, in what sense do those become reality? In what sense do those bleed over and become what we think of as reality? Because reality, or at least like, think of history. History is composed of these narratives and where do we get our narratives from? You know, ultimately we fall back on these kind of, you know, these tropes of, of narrative literature and whatnot, usually to tell stories that, and that bleed over so much that this is where I definitely see a kind of, um, you know, this is, this is very similar to Baudrillard's idea about the, the simulacrum and simulation where the the you know the simulation of something becomes so immersed with the apparent reality of it that a kind of undiluted unproblematic reality is no longer there because it's so just mixed in with what we see as as fiction or the imagination in these things so i think that's very interesting yeah i, I, um, I was oh sorry actually ed you go ahead Begging your pardon, um, Chase, when you were talking, there's a classic uh, Western movie, The Man Who Shot Liberty Valance. And you don't realize what happens um, until the very end. And the newspaper editor who is hearing the story from a U.S. senator who made his mark in this little dusty town, it seems like it's Arizona or New Mexico, um, says, um, he, he, he uses the phrase when, uh, when the legend becomes fact, print the legend. And it's, it's about how, what is, what is it about the understanding about what really happened? And even if what really happened didn't really happen, if that has become infused and become part of the marrow, marrow of a community, at what cost to the community would, 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 in be, would happen if you actually said, nope, that's not how it really happened. I'm thinking of this uh, Nietzschean notion that everything is interpretation and that and I, I don't know how much this I'm getting from Nietzsche and how much I'm getting from Sartre or, or who knows where, but that, and I've mentioned this before, that um, life is a collection of events. There isn't any real narrative. And yet we, we require, we, human beings seem to be constituted that we require narratives. And so we have to provide narratives and so this, you know, this story and actually the next one also, you know, seemed to, for me, raise the question of, you know, what is a narrative, and like Chase was saying, what is a narrative, where do they come from? And one place, I mean, I suspect it's probably true, as Chase was suggesting, that a lot of the narratives that we use to paste together an understanding of our lives and the life of our nation and the life of the world are actually you know, taken from classic literature and from, you know, I, they, you, people used to say that in every home in America, or at least every well-educated home, there were two books, the Bible and the plays of Shakespeare. And, you know, you, and you've probably heard discussions about how many uh, idioms are, can be traced back to one of those two sources. And so, you know, we, and we have these cultural myths and these personal myths which isn't to say that they're bad, because I, I don't, again, don't know that we can live without myths, but the, you know, the, what, what's the difference between someone consciously layering an interpretation over a set of facts like happened here and just what we do all the time anyway. And then in the, you know, in the next story, this guy manipulates events so that they fit into a narrative that he's trying to construct, which is a little bit different, but it, it's similar in that, you know, we're, we have to have these 
these narratives, and like in the second story, maybe it's uh, to some degree trying to push us that direction, but in the, in the next story, um, there's a narrative that the investigator is looking for. And so his, his opponent realizes that and then says, okay, I'll give you the narrative you're looking for. And that narrative will help you find the facts that I want you to find. But in both cases, in both of these stories, there's this, you know, it seems like there's this issue of, you know, like Chase was saying, you know, what's reality and what's not? Well, I don't know that there, I, you know, like I think someone like Nietzsche would say there is no unmediated reality to get to. There is just the interpretation. And there are facts scattered throughout that interpretation, but those facts are susceptible to probably an infinite number of interpretations. And we live within the interpretation because we don't live in a world of bare facts. We live in a, in a, in a narrative, in a, in a world, world of stories. You know, I wonder, um, speaking of, uh, you know, the, the whole idea about this is interpretation. Um, I don't know if anyone here is familiar with, um, I'm not sure how to pronounce his name. It's like Gadama, I think. So I think he's, I don't really know much about him except that he's basically saying to some degree that kind of like, so Heidegger's, you know, idea of, you know, like being in the world is essentially a kind of hermeneutic interpretation that our interpretation is an actual mode of our being in the world. So I think that could possibly like tie in here in some interesting ways that I'm not totally sure of, but it is essentially, you know, we're, we're guided by so many stories and so many, you know, just images of, of character tropes and things like that, that it, it makes sense that essentially these uh, interpretations of whatever are part of essentially our world, especially the, you know, the, the social world. But then, you know, you can never have any kind of easy delimitation of one sphere from another because they're constantly bleeding into each other. And that's almost kind of what that interpretation is, is it's kind of this, uh, there, there's sort of these flows and, and connections between all these different spheres that the intellect wants to, to delimit in very precise, you know, geometric ways. But then real life is, is, is much messier than that. It's got a kind of liquid uh, plastic quality to it. I remember that I can't remember the name of the episode. There's a Star, a Star Trek Next Generation episode where they where they run into a culture that everything they say is in historical reference, or everything they say is is in reference to a st historical narrative. So um, leave it Shaka when the walls fell. I could be yeah. wrong. Yeah, yeah, that's the one. Yeah, and I, I uh, was a TA in a intro to philosophy class at UT where the professor, well, it was Higgins, she played that episode on the first day. And uh, I mean, that's an interesting, maybe an intensification of this kind of thinking in that, you know, everything that race conceived of was conceived of as a reference to some kind of historical narrative. So every conceptual frame they had apparently had to be cast within some sort of cultural narrative. And, um, and again, you know, you could say that that's still true. I mean, I, I sometimes joke, um, my, he doesn't as much as he used to, but my son used to watch a fair amount of, uh, what, of uh, ma manga and, or read some of that stuff and then look at some of those, you know, the Japanese cartoons and stuff. And that shit just don't make any sense to me. Like I, I've watched <laughs> some of those shows and they're they're visually beautiful but there what was the one there was one that was real uh, it was in the uh the big theaters a few years ago um that was real popular and it was beautiful but it was just so disorienting because there were these 
these weird creatures that would just sort of show up and do stuff. And I'm like, what was that about? And then there would be some weird machine over here that would be doing some weird thing. I'm like, I have no idea what that's about. And it was just so disorienting. And, and you know, if I read a little bit of it, it's like, well, if you were Japanese or if you had been watching this stuff for the last 10 years, this would totally make sense to you. And so, you know, there's these, these cultural frames of reference that we carry around with us that um, sort of pre, pre-interpret and sort of pre, not predetermine, but present a range of possibilities for our understanding. That if, and if we, don't have, if we don't have access to them, the world's very disorienting. I, I'm, I'm really curious which, uh, uh, were you watching a Pokemon movie? Was this one of the Digimon movies? What, 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 because that's what your description made it. If you don't remember, it's fun. Well, I've, I've watched, I've seen some Pokemon, you know, movies just, just kind of not really sat and watched them all the way through. And those, those confuse me, but just Naruto confuses me. But the one that I was talking about that I saw in the theater that was so beautiful was uh, Spirited Away. Oh, oh, I watched that a few days ago. Oh. Really? I mean, it's, yeah. It's, but there's this stuff, these weird creatures that show up and these things that are happening. I'm like, I don't know what's going on here. <laughs> oh, the, I, yeah, can, I can yeah. see that with Spirited Away. That, that, that makes a certain amount of sense. Have you just, I, I know this is very off topic. Have you, have you watched Full Metal Alchemist? I, it's on Netflix. If if I'm allowed to assign homework, I would say Full Metal Alchemist Brotherhood. Well, there, there have you guys seen versions. Akira? Watch Brotherhood. I have not seen Akira. It's on my list. Yeah, it's on my list too, but I've seen clips of it, and it's really big with the, the accelerationists, so it should be interesting. Looking forward to that. I'll probably watch that tonight. That'll be my own self-appointed homework. Yeah, that's that, that's how you spell it, yeah. Well, someone has to help me figure out how to manipulate my television so I can see Netflix. I'm really bad with technology. Notice the books behind me. That's that's what I deal with. It's that's that's fair. I don't know. It you know, it's not like the biggest deal in the world, but I I I think that that um Full Metal Alchemist is a really good. Even if you watched the original version, I happen to like Brotherhood a little bit more, but um um it, it has some interesting philosophical themes specifically. So it's the main reason I mentioned it. Another, th- so when you first set, started referencing Star Trek, I've actually had a, a different, a Star Trek Deep Space Nine episode in my head, basically since, um, since reading this one, the, um, uh, I want to specify and the name was alluding me, theme of the traitor and the hero. Um, uh, you watch the animated ghosts in the machine. Uh, <laughs> Hmm, I'll have to think about it. Um, but there's this really interesting episode from uh, Deep Space Nine that follows somewhat similarly to the story, right? Um, I forget the name of it, but um, uh, Jatsia Dax, who's a Trill, um, right? And Trill are this alien species where a sort of normally mortal human-esque alien um, is combined with a worm that has like continuous... Uh, memories from each of the hosts, right? And so it jumps from host to host to host. Um, but the the specific hosts die, but their memories gets transferred with the worm, right? So they continue living on in the next person, hypothetically. And the whole episode revolves around a situation where Jatsia's prior host, um, who s- s- several of the characters re- uh, remember and like knew personally, um, is being accused of being the traitor uh, uh, that was part of a larger revolution that was happening on a planet. And basically what had happened was there was, there was some sort of traitor uh, who was communicating uh, information to the enemy. Um, the, one of the leaders of this revolution uh, dies and he becomes a martyr. And him dying you know, pisses off the soldiers so much that they go out and they, they win whatever the revolution is and they overthrow the government. Um, so the son of that guy... Uh, is has been apparently going around trying to track down who it was who who was the traitor presumably to like find his his father or his murderer um and he's narrowed it down to well the only the the last person he thinks it could be is is dax um but the problem is is that dax prior host is dead and the worm is now in a new person so he's taking this legal case 
um, against the um, against Jadzia. And so the whole episode uh, revolves around this like this complicated question of identity because basically like um, they right, they they don't have any uh, evidence to counter. Uh, the accusation, so they're basically just arguing that Jatsia can't possibly be held, you know, morally responsible for the actions of her prior host. Um, and there's a whole bunch of ambiguity around that. Jatsia doesn't even really agree with that, and she seems willing to have herself sort of taken away to be punished for this particular crime. Eventually, the uh, the, the sort of resolution of the episode is, uh, because this is old enough, I'm not going to feel bad about spoiling it, um, the Hero's uh, widow uh, comes along and testifies in court that um, Jatsia's prior host was actually in bed with her at the time they were having an affair. And so he couldn't possibly have been the uh, traitor because or, uh, we, have, we can vouch for her whereabouts at the time, basically. Um, and that's how the, the, the sort of the court case concludes. But in a kind of aside between the two of them afterwards, um, you find out that it was actually the guy who died and became the martyr of this revolution who was actually the traitor. Um, and him dying happened to just be fortuitous. Like basically, it, 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 you know, it, it pissed everybody off and it, and it had them run, win the revolution, but it turned out that he was a traitor. Um, and I guess I, you know, I was trying to decide whether or not I wanted to bring it up because I don't know how much the story um, actually like adds to the conversation that we're having. But I think the interesting thing ab about it to me um, is this, this, the funny thing that the episode does, which the episode just becomes like super obsessed with this really thorny philosophical question about whether or not, um, uh, you know, Jatsia can be held uh, responsible for the crimes of her, when it turns out that like, that doesn't, ha like she's not, she's right, even if that was true, she's not guilty. Even if that were true, there's this whole other sort of, this whole other sort of story was happening underneath in terms of what was going on. I mean, I, I think that there's something kind of interesting there um, in terms of the, the Borges story. Um, I mean, I think it can almost become, you know, one, one question that I had when I got to the end of it was whether or not this was in fact true or whether this was just wild speculation. I mean, I think the third story that we read, right, the, um, uh, why am I always forgetting, the Death yes, and the Compass, compass. right? Uh, like I mean, it's 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 sort of suggesting to us this this, this uh, situation where a you know a person comes up with a narrative and then it turns out that that narrative is false but has been constructed to appear true, um, and it would be an interesting sort of near image if um, a theme of the traitor and the hero if it you know you you you're this interpreter you're looking through the historical record you come up with this weird hypothesis that maybe well maybe it was really um, uh, what's the name of the guy um Kilpatrick who 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 was really the 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 betrayer right really the guilty party here um but yet but yet oh well but you know he maybe he was even aware of a right he was in on the conspiracy and he'd made the decision to kind of allow himself to die for the revolution or whatever you know and then at the by the end of it you know the historian um sort of just decides that they're not going to tell anyone the story and you know one reason that you could give for why they're not going to tell anyone this 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 discovery is because, you know, that it would sort of sully um, the the image of this revolution, right, that occurred. And um, uh, on the other hand, like, is it is it just speculation? Do we have any reason to even believe this story other than, you know, these little details that the, you know, why, wh why couldn't history have just repeated it itself in this instance? Why, why couldn't there just be these resonances with, with Shakespeare? Again, if, right, if those things are just replete in the culture and if, if people know about them and if these are classical images of, of right, I mean, what you know, tr traditional um, Irish lore has ideas about the cyclicality of time and, um, and about reincarnation and, and all of these sort of different features. Um, why, I, you know, why is it more plausible that um, this was all arranged so as to bring about the illusion of an event um, but with like clues peppered in, right? I mean, I'm thinking almost back to um, to the Babylon story, right? In terms of like this question of, well, is there really a centralizing agency that is indicating all of the, or like, you know, sort, sort of managing all of this randomness in the city of Babylon? Or is is that just what life is like? And does does life just sometimes imitate art? And, and that's just a fact that you have to live with. You know, one yeah. little... Um, 
Go ahead. One little uh, blurb to sort of support that possible interpretation. Um, on my page 74, this one, two, three, four, five paragraphs from the end, four, or um, the last sentence, Ryan investigates the matter. The investigation is one of the gaps in my plot. And so the, the interpretation of this all being, having been set up by Nolan is something that is the, the, that the, de the investigation that came to that conclusion is missing. In other words, it's not there. He provides no evidence that that interpretation um, is based in fact, you know, that this business about uh, reinterpreting all this stuff and that Kilpatrick really was a traitor. None of that, you know, there's no evidence for that. He just says, this is a gap in my plot. And so it, that does seem to sort of explicitly leave open the possibility that this, that interpretation was a fabrication, uh, you know, and, and that maybe things did just happen that way. And then somebody, and then this Ryan then, or whoever's writing this then just uh, decided to present it as if it was Sorry, Chase, go. Okay. Yeah. So I think that's a really interesting notion that basically, you know, how do we really know that this is, you know, a straightforward conscious copying of these elements, you know, Julius Caesar to some degree, maybe, or Shakespeare. So, um, so I read, I got Borges's collected um non fictions here and it's pretty pretty good i've only read a little bit but i read this uh thing he, he wrote about circular time and he references in here something from uh from shakespeare where shakespeare says that you know wait was this in one of the previous stories i can't remember now or something about uh, Shakespeare says that, you know, maybe one man is all men. Uh, was that in the first story we read? Okay, yeah. I'm, I'm confused here. I'm, I'm, I'm stuck in the labyrinth, I guess. But I think that helps support that idea that, you know, okay, well, maybe Kilpatrick, you know, was uh, Julius Caesar to some degree. And Julius Caesar was probably a copy also of some other kind of, you know, archetype in some sense, some kind of narrative, you know, instinctual pattern of, of society that, that t just tends to repeat itself because there is a kind of uh, just a, a tendency for habit itself to work that way. So I think it's interesting that it could be, you know, this could be an example of, you know, how Bergson, he says that, you know, we tend to kind of look at things um, in a kind of retroactive perspective and, and piece them together that way. So maybe something like that is them looking back and saying like, oh, look at all these resonances with Shakespeare and, and these other stories and whatnot, when really maybe it's just the event itself was a kind of resonance that was maybe not so much like consciously modeled after it, but still maybe contributed in some way. And then afterwards, they're going back and adding things to this in a way to, to kind of hint at, at something maybe later on. I, I'm not sure, but I think it's interesting to think of it that way and more kind of go into, because a lot of the story isn't just talking about like how they like pulled this off. It's about like, well, this guy reasons there may be, you know, like secret forms of time. And he talks about all these different notions of circular time and whatnot. And in Borges' own, you know, nonfiction stories, he's got one thing on circular time. He's got another one on um, the doctrine of cycles, which seems to be almost entirely about Nietzsche and the eternal return and all this stuff. So... Yeah, some interesting notions there. I, I kind of like this idea that it's not just simply a, you know, a straightforward act of them kind of copying Shakespeare because they were running out of time. 
I think it, it's something even more complex kind of going on there. In the previous story, it, the, the line was, um, um, perhaps Schopenhauer was right. I am all other men. Any man is all men. Shakespeare is in some manner the miserable John Vincent Moon. Um, well, but if you look at the parallelism with, with the last story, and, and, you know, Travis's point is, is Moon um, worthy of forgiveness? It seems to me one of the reasons why maybe, do you ever notice it that if someone doesn't forgive himself, other people are willing to say, well, if he's not willing to forgive himself, I guess I'm not either. So, um, but, but here, to me, Kilpatrick is, is if, if I'm accepting what's on the pages, Kilpatrick was able to redeem himself, right? Moon received his 30 pieces of silver and he, and he bought this land in Argentina. Kilpatrick said, okay, fine. Yeah, we'll go through this drama. We'll go, we'll go through these roles. So even though I am a traitor, I will still die not as a traitor, but as this national hero. And so you do have redemption in this story where you, it's questionable if you have it in the other one. Yeah, I wonder uh, if that was one of the points. I'm sorry, go ahead, Travis. I was just going to say that, uh, yeah, I think, I think that's interesting, that, that c connection, because, you know, for me, I, I almost see it as, as like, like if it's this story, if it's this this like play in a sense that Phil Patrick, instead of actually, you know, redeeming himself, just plays a part and 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 is performing as this this redemption. Um, but in a way, I think he probably sees himself as kind of just acting, you know, just being this separate identity. Um, so I'm almost inclined to appreciate Vincent Moon's approach more than uh Kilpatrick's so I don't know what that means about me but <laughs> and you're a bloody coward well you know, go ahead I was just gonna push us on to the we only have about 10 minutes left I was gonna push us on <coughs> but you know you can say go ahead and say whatever the hell you want to say <laughs> Uh, Wait, that shut everybody up. Would you rather be Abraham Lincoln, <laughs> who has a statue of him in a Greek temple in Washington, D.C., that will last 2,000 years, or would you rather be William Seward, his Secretary of State, who got to live for the rest of his life, you know, doing things? You know, would you rather be on the pedestal or would you rather be alive? There is a certain cost to being a true hero, even if you're flawed. I so... Mean, is Lincoln's, is Lincoln's place in American history, in American myth, an American imagination and history connected to him being assassinated on Good Friday? The assassinated yeah. period and being assassinated on Good Friday right at the very end of a successful war. Which kind of complicates the identity of Lincoln himself because then it's like, well, is the icon of Lincoln in the popular imagination, the same thing as Lincoln? You know, where exactly does one person end and the other begin? Or it's kind of, you know, we have these sort of narratives or icons of people, especially, you know, famous historical people that it, it's, I think that those are a lot of the times the cases where you see the people that are, um, that find res, we use these resonances with earlier historical narrative figures and kind of superimpose those to make sense of these new ones for our own age. And, you know, you can see stuff, something like, um, like Jung's ideas about archetypes and also, you know, Joseph Campbell later took Jung's ideas with, you know, the, the myth of the hero where you or then the hero's journey which is kind of like this uh a lot of people point out 
problems with that, that it doesn't apply to every story, of course, but that there is a kind of, you know, kind of basic general structure to these stories that they follow in all these different cultures, which is kind of interesting. But, um, okay, yeah, so to talk about Death in the Compass for the next, like, 15 minutes. Um, so this story, what I found interesting about it and the way that it connects, I think, with a lot of his other themes is that first there's kind of this, uh, he seems to want to make a distinction a lot between a kind of intellectual human knowledge. It's kind of like this very symmetrical, geometric, perfect quality. And then this kind of messiness of the non-human noumenal realm. But then they kind of blend into each other. And here he's, he's showing that in the sense that you know, this detective is given this order to things and the kind of the weight of it is, is so strong that it almost has to manifest itself in order to complete itself to the point where this guy sets it up where like, okay, I'm going to make it where, you know, it has to be this fourfold murder and just kind of the idea of that acts as an attractor that actually makes it happen, that makes it actually occur in reality. That just the very symmetry of the idea is what brings it into existence. So, of course, you could see similarities there, a, a, a reflection of the Tulun Ukbar story, uh, basically that, you know, mind the the minds of men are seduced by this symmetry and this order to, to bring these things into existence that, that we become just the mere, the mere functionaries of these ideas that just kind of come into existence. And we just can't help, but basically do their bidding. Yeah. Well, look at the first paragraph. I mean, I never saw this before. Maybe it doesn't exist. But this, this first paragraph of the stories, in some ways, is a perfect complement to the last paragraph of Emma Zuntz. You, you know, it, it talks about Lonrot, and it says, it's true that Eric Lonrot failed to prevent the last murder, but that he foresaw it, it, it is indisputable, right? Neither did he guess the identity of the luckless assassin, but he did succeed in divining the secret morphology behind the Phoenix series, as well as the participation of Red Scarlock. Uh, and and what's, what's strange about it is, even though what this narrator is saying, Lunrat snapped to, it seems to be, it, it's odd that he'd be saying it that way because it was because of his obsession with this symbolic symbolism of these killings, one of which didn't exist, right? The third killing didn't exist. It was, it was created by the, uh, by the criminal because he himself was the supposed victim. Um, when his friends came, he was wearing that mask. But even if it is true that, that this detective understood certain things, it's really almost insulting because it's he missed the bigger picture. I mean, he was wrong on why why did the why did the first killing occur, even though his associate said, "Oh, it's obvious. The man has a bunch of sapphires across the hall." I mean, the, the, someone just got confused in the hotel, which is spot on, right? And 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 not guessing the identity of the last victim, I think, is fairly important. <laughs> right <laughs> because it's the detective himself so it's it's an odd way it's 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 a very laconic way of saying yeah this he did get some things right and we should give him some credit and i'm like what i don't know i i just thought that this was a really interesting strange paragraph uh for this story uh, i was trying to you know i was thinking about what the difference between um, 
the these two these last two stories in terms of uh, people providing these sort of uh, narrative frameworks for interpretation that we were talking about, and then the the uh, tr the um, traitor and the hero. The guy who constructs this narrative does so after the fact. Well, no, actually, not true after the fact, but he he does so based upon pre-existing narratives. <laughs> And he lays this narrative out in, to provide a certain kind of interpretation, but there's not a whole lot of manipulation that, that is happening here. So everyone kind of agrees, yeah, we're gonna play into this narrative and we're gonna, we're gonna do this. So there's a little bit of agency there, but not a lot. Whereas in the second one, this guy constructs a narrative that is in, specifically intended to manipulate people specifically the detective. And so I, I, you know, maybe this is a facile interpretation, but you could say if, if we live in these interpretations sort of necessarily, sometimes we just do so completely unconsciously because it's a natural part of, of our lives. Sometimes we maybe do them partially consciously like in the, in the traitor and hero, but then you can also, you can also use that tendency to manipulate human beings you know, which is something that is extremely apparent, you know, in contemporary America. You know, you have people using, um, you know, particular, particular narratives to focus and direct people's attention and action. And so, anyway, just another, uh, an, another interesting way. Of, you know, I'm wondering that you wonder with how, why the editor, editors put stories together in the way they did in this book. And it seems like these three form a nice, sequence yeah i agree i uh i just had this interesting experience because i was i was reading it aloud actually pr pretty like like th this afternoon and like just in the first paragraph i was like struggling <laughs> to like pronounce all the words and like like i just got so caught up kind of in in all these different words and the meaning of them that i i felt separated from kind of the story in the same way that I think Lonrot kind of felt separated from the reality of the situation. Like he got caught so deeply into this, this imaginative, uh, fantastical kind of idea that it became true uh, because of that, I think. And yeah, so I just, I just feel like I had kind of <clears throat> a similar experience. Like when, when he says, uh, hold on a second, let me find it. Yeah. He says, uh, Lonrock considered the remote possibility that the fourth victim might be Sherlock himself. Then he rejected the idea. He had very nearly deciphered the problem. Mere circumstances, reality hardly interested him now. And that's at the bottom of 82, sorry. Uh, and I just really felt like that was interesting was that, you know, all, all of the, like, the circumstances and the reality of the situation is what originally kind of led him to this idea. But then he got so caught up in it eventually that he felt distanced from that and, and, and kind of couldn't realize what was going to be, what was about to happen and his his kind of own role in it he he kind of took this objective perspective to the point to where he kind of lost his own sense of what he was doing and uh i felt kind of similarly as i was reading it although i i'm not i wonder about objective because you know on page the second page of the story page 77 in this edition when lone rot is talking to uh whatever the other guy is true uh, Traveronis, mm -hmm. and you know the uh, the detective is saying, "Well, we've got some data here. It's not, you know, we're not looking for a three-legged cat, whatever that means. I guess that means we're not looking for something weird. You know, we want to get the most straightforward interpret straightforward." And then Lonra he applies, "Possible, but not interesting." You reply that reality hasn't the least obligation to be interesting, and I'll answer you that reality may avoid that obligation, but that hypotheses may not. And the hypothesis that and so on and so it's like you know lone rot has this predisposition to want this to be an interesting case uh and so which which probably makes him even you know especially susceptible to the manipulations of this guy because this guy realizes oh look he's reading all these books on uh jewish mysticism and all this i bet i can lure him along here and so i don't know just another maybe indication you know if we have a a narrative that we're particularly fond of, uh, it's we're more likely to pursue that. Just as a side quote, because I'm a I was a um, X Files fan, 
at one point, someone says to, um, God, what's his name? Mulder. Uh, Mulder. That's the guy. <laughs> Terrible. Mulder, something about, about Occam's razor, you know? Don't you want to use Occam's razor here? And he says, Occam's razor, I call that the principle of limited imagination. <laughs> so. <coughs> so, Hunter, are you going to go? Or well, I was, I was I'll let you guys go. I was going to make a comparison to Parasite. There's a movie recently by a Korean director called Parasite. And uh, this just whole, the whole thing really reminds me of a main character who's a son. Uh, the whole story is about an underclass family that's trying to, to find wealth through kind of exploiting these upper class uh, rich individuals who are exploiting the labor of the underclass, but the underclass are kind of trying to, to get back at them and siphon as much money from them as they can. And all, all the while, one of the characters, the young teenage boy, is given this gift by this rich guy and it's this rock. It's this really big rock that he says is like the, the rock of luck and wealth and happiness and whatever. And he says like, oh, that's so metaphorical. Oh, that's just so crazy. Oh my God. And he just falls in love with it. He gets obsessed. And he's carrying around this gigantic boulder in his arms the whole, the whole movie. And then at one point, they hear a horrible noise coming from the basement. And he's almost certain that it's, the, the spoilers, by the way, there's a guy in the basement. He's, they're in this big house and he, they hear this. Don't spoil it. I mean, I've, I've seen it, but if you haven't seen it, it's really a good movie. Well, he's about to go into this basement where there's this guy, and for some reason, some part of him, obsessed with how how metaphorical it all is, he he takes this before going down to the basement to investigate this horrible noise. He t he takes the boulder, the rock of luck and wealth and happiness, and he's just he's hauling it down to this basement. As soon as he reaches the bottom floor, he gets clubbed and beaten, and then. The, the guy in the basement grabs the rock and just starts bashing him in the head with this, with this long, like rock of luck and wealth. And then he so just, metaphorical. Yes. It's just <laughs> this, this total loss of, of what's going on and the value of these images and this greater scheme that's trying to be applied to make it all make more sense, you know, rather than just being this horrible, objective, miserable reality in a way. Yeah, it was the, so the rock was the symbol of his trying to of his struggle basically to get wealth and the the under the lower class people trying to get some kind of status socially that's what it represented and it basically represented ultimately the actions that trying to cling to that rock especially in the water which water is a, is a huge symbol in the film to show basically struggle and also to show kind of that these class um, divisions, I think, are, are still fluid to a certain degree, that there's kind of this movement there. But he's, because he's clinging to the rock in the water, it's ultimately a self-destructive self action. So, yeah, there's a lot more I could say about Parasite, which is a great movie. But so... One thing that I think is interesting about this story is, so I mentioned I do tarot card readings. So most people, when they think of tarot cards, they think, oh, that's fortune telling. You know, you're telling people the future. I think that idea is stupid. I, I, don't, I'm not, I don't think the future even necessarily exists in the sense that, you know, the future is some preset thing so the way i see it is like people expect like you'll get a card yes definitely <laughs> i mean I, I like to consider myself a, a luciferian more than satan but that's more based on the etymology but anyways so people expect you know you'll get a card that represents some kind of the way i see it is that it's some kind of like a potential aspect of of your personality that you then reflect on and it gives you guidance now in the present about something. And basically you have to make those connections yourself in the present, but it, it, it's about something that guides your action now and not something that's saying something about your future necessarily. 
So, and there's this chance aspect to it, but the thing is that, you know, it's not necessarily that you just, um, that you're given these cards and then they simply present you the future. Otherwise, those things kind of create the future themselves. By somebody getting those cards and you telling them this means this is going to happen, often that influences the future to the sense that you can kind of make something happen or actually steer the future in one way or another, which kind of negates the idea of a preset future anyways. So there's this, there's this tendency, I think, in this kind of divination where thinking about basically this, this uh, the original crime was a, was a total chance encounter that the, they were trying to steal the sapphires in the other room and they just happened to marry, marry uh, to kill this, this Kabbalistic, you know, Jewish guy working that happened to be typing on his typewriter this thing about the Tetragrammaton, you know, the four names of God, the, what is the, the first letter of the name has been uttered. And then they basically, so they basically use this chance encounter to then kind of divine an order from that. But yet they can't really actually, so he says, you know, he did succeed in divine the secret morphology behind the Fiendish series. So it's like you can kind of see the order of it given in a chance encounter, but still that order requires interpretation ultimately to steer it in one way or another. So that's why I think it's important to kind of see that aspect that this is still something because he acts in a way that it just happens, you know, so automatically in line with the, these ideas as if it's already preset where I just personally like to see it as something where let's instead think about this, these chance encounters, you know, in a more open-ended way that they can influence basically how we understand things. We can interpret things now, but ultimately they're not going to preset anything except unless you adopt them as an order on which to act. So basically there's almost like this leap of faith of acting in line with the, you know, the divine order that you perceive, whatever the, the chance images you're given, but ultimately you're the one that is dictating that, deciding that. So that was quite a rant, but I'm done. Yeah, it, this goes back to kind of what Nevit was saying earlier about what I had said. But yeah, I think maybe not like having an objective perspective, but uh, kind of what I was thinking was like questioning, and I'm sure Borges thought a lot about this, but like having this kind of imaginative attitude and, and, and creating these stories and, and, and kind of being in this fantastical kind of world what does that do to your sense of self and, and, and to your own identity as a person? And I think like in this story, his, his imagination and his, his ability to kind of create this, this, this perfect, interesting plot kind of distances, him, him, distances himself from being able to see his place in it, you know? So I, I think that, yeah, when you're, when you're kind of creating something or, or you're, you're going out, you know, like in the tarot cards or anything, and, and you're kind of putting yourself out there and expressing yourself, I think it's really easy to get lost kind of in that expression and, and maybe forget why you're doing it or forget what the meaning of it even is. So, yeah. Well, it's, it's like the danger of over intellectualism. You're actually cutting yourself from the lived reality, lived human experience, right? I mean, it's not emotional, right? You're, you're, not, you're not basing important decisions of your life on emotions. And you know, if, if, and we think maybe many times emotionalism is, is bad, but when you think of very important decisions like who are you gonna marry? Who have you married? Who, who would you like to marry? I mean, who, who, who are you in a relationship with? 
if you get out the slide rule or a pocket calculator and look at the pros and cons, or is it, I like to be with this person. I think I'm falling in love with this person. I mean, the very important connections we have, I think we would view our, the other person as a monster or a machine to use another metaphor, right? Uh, thanks, thanks, think about robots that we would say, wait, there's something wrong with this person. If they're going to get married based on an actuary table about wealth 20 years from now, it's like, is that really how you think that's, that's why you're marrying that person rather than deep human emotion. And, you know, we talked about this before in, in other Borges' short stories of the totalistic, right. You know, with Talon, uh, uh, ideological systems, but also what what does at the very personal individual level, what are the costs? So I just want to say, I know several people I think that would base a marriage decision off uh, basically something in it with a calculator. They would calculate something and figure that out. I think it's a it's a serious. Um, uh, temptation to a lot of people. One thing that I, I was sort of thinking about from the beginning of this, and, and, and I think that um, maybe it ties into what Ed just said in interesting ways. Uh, I had this feeling when I read this story that I don't think I, I, like the first time I remember having it was sort of, the, I think the first time I read the genealogy of morals. And, and I think that this like captures a good, like emotive aspect of what someone like Nietzsche or like some of the postmodernists kind of achieve in the sense that like um, there's this beautiful image of an intellectual edifice and then you kind of step back from it and you go, there are these like horrifying mechanistic tools that surround it, right? And so, right, if we're talking about like, like, like a criticism of um, the, the, right, the kind of nihilistic ethics that Nietzsche, right, his, his capacity to show that they were the product of this journey of power and that they didn't necessarily come from a legitimate intellectual interest. Although I, to a certain, I mean, this is the thing that I think is, is particularly terrifying about it to me. And I think why this short story captures it so well, because it's not just a purely anti-emotional thing that Lonrod is like doing here, right? Like there, there is a genuine love of the beauty of a particular crime, right? Which right. There's all sorts of things going on there in terms of, um, like, oh, you know, Kantian irrationality or something like that, if we wanted to talk about it. But just the simple fact that he goes, no, I'm not going to go with the simple, obvious, arguably mechanistic answer to this case. Um, and he turns and he says, no, I'm going to, I'm going to create this beautiful edifice. And then that edifice gets turned around into a weapon that is ultimately his own demise. I mean, I, that's, that is exactly how I felt when I read the genealogy of morals. And I thought about my interest in, in Platonism and and Aristotelianism and all of these different, you know, sort of not idealist, but, you know, very rationalistic models and then realize that it's like, oh, everything that I thought was beautiful and, you know, amazing about them was shielding me to the fact that they weren't accounting for reality in a, in a, in a way that was horrifying. You know, on the, on the other hand, you know, I think if, you know, that's a very, very good point, but I, you know, I think if everything is interpretation, if we live in an ultimately inter, and maybe not everybody agrees with that, but I, I, I don't know, it seems like a pretty compelling thesis to me. Um, then, so, I, so if that's the case, and if we have no choice but to live in an interpretation, then the question becomes, what do we do with that? And, you know, one of my, one of the, the ways I've read Nietzsche, right or wrong, is that we have no choice but to live in an interpretation, but it's important which interpretation we choose. And I have had a, a long-term difficulty with that because it's hard for me to, th I've mentioned this before, it's hard for me to think, you know, I'm gonna pick this myth and I'm gonna live by this myth all the while realizing it's a myth because I, I take part of, my sense is part of what Nietzsche is saying is never, make the mistake of, of thinking your myth is reality. You've got to keep realizing it is the myth and nevertheless acting as if it were real. And that, you know, that just make it so hard. But, you know, some of the things that Chase was saying made me think maybe there's a way to think of adopting an interpretation as kind of a heuristic 
for finding meaning in life. And so, you know, you might say, I think, I mean, I think what Nietzsche's problem with the Christian myth is that in his view, it's unhealthy. It's destructive to humanity. And so you have to pick a myth, but I think he would say you should pick a myth or an interpretation that is a healthy one for yourself and for this, you know, and for the human species. And um, but so then, so then, uh, you know, if I think, you know, kind of like what Chase was saying about tarot, which I know nothing about, but, you know, maybe you use, you use this story that you're living in as a heuristic for finding, for, I mean, you can use it sort of as a way for directing yourself through life and saying, I want to make choices that kind of fit with this story because I find this to be a, a more healthy story for me. And then that, you know, gives me a way of construct, it becomes something that is more, uh, and, and that is something that I have agency in. You know, I am constructing a story, and I realize I'm constructing a story, but I'm doing it in such a way that, it, that it's going to provide maximum meaning for my life, realizing that I just made this shit up. But nevertheless, it provides me a way of deciding how to make choices, given that there's really no you know, no ultimate basis for choice anyway. And so it seems like it could be a, a positive thing in that regard. Um, and, you know, maybe, I mean, may, you know, maybe this, maybe this story is also a cautionary tale about what happens when you take your story too seriously. And, and you're not, you, you kind of forget that it's a story. Um, maybe that's another danger, but it seems to me there could be a positive role here in saying, well, how is it that you live in a self-constructed interpretation all the while realizing that's exactly what it is? Well, I beg your pardon for using a cliche, but self-fulfilling prophecy. I mean, he's right because that's how he was acting. And he, he went to that house by himself without anybody else from the police department. And uh, so, you know, but ultimately maybe he would, maybe Lon Rock would say, that's okay. I mean, I, I, don't, I don't know, but he might, you know, he might say, hey, I'm fulfilling this destiny that I, in a sense, constructed for myself through my own interpretation. And if this is the, uh, the end and it's the end that's meaningful for me, maybe that's not a bad thing. You know, Nietzsche said something like, you know, it would be nice if, you, if everyone could kind of choose their own end. Unfortunately, he was not able to do that. But, um, you know, you see, that you see this trope in literature sometimes where people are walking down something that's something like a self-chosen fate. And when they get the end of it and it's tragic, they just say, that's what I chose. Well, that your interpretation of it, I think, does have some support in the last long paragraph of the story, right? Because it's, it's the detective talking to the criminal, uh, even though he's avoiding the criminal's eyes, right? He says, you know, in your labyrinth, there are three lines too many. And then he mentions the old Greek, a labyrinth that has a single straight line. And, uh, and he says, along that line, so many philosophers have lost themselves that a mere detective might well do so too. Scarlack, when in some other incarnation you hunt me, pretend to commit or do commit a crime at A, then the second crime at B, you know, all, all the geometry there, wait for me afterwards, and then kill me at D as you are now going to kill me, you know, at this place. And then the, the, the what what does the what does the criminal say? But yes, I, I I I do promise you that. I think that's kind of a joke. The I, I think he's talking about Sean. Are you leaving? Okay, I, I need I want to ask you one question for you. I think that's a sort of a joke. I think he's talking. That, I think that labyrinth is Zeno's paradox that he's talking about there. And I think yeah, it, I, I think it's oh, yeah. Zeno's paradox. If you look so. at the, he's basically saying like halfway between that yeah which means he would never kill them kill him because he would never get to the end of it you know he would always be saying well, wait till i get halfway and wait till i get halfway and wait till i get halfway so i think it's sort of a joke that lon rot's saying if you do that you'll never actually be able to kill me in right the next and, life. 
and his and his promise is, I promise you that labyrinth consisting of a single line, which is invisible and unceasing, uh, right? It like this invisible and unceasing. Like I don't know. I just have this image of like the of the solution to the paradox, which is right. It's just like no, there's an infinite number of of discrete. Like like no, we we know how calculus works. Like you get there eventually. There is not an you. It does not take you forever to get from point A to point B, right? <laughs> like the it's, it's it's a solvable paradox, right? There's this like there's just this grin of the. I, I don't know. I you know perhaps I'm being overly ideological here, but like my I, I I'm I'm reading the criminal here is 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 you know taking the 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 crap out of uh um uh lawn rot in the same way that uh you know people like nietzsche or or uh, again these postmodernists or myself might you know take the you know d just be like uh all this intellectual look it the, the hair makes it right or the the you know the uh eventually the you know achilles does pass the turtle or you know, look like <laughs> Yeah, this is an interesting intellectual thing you've built here, but it clearly doesn't res correspond to reality, at least in some sense, right? Yeah, Bergson writes a lot about how Zeno's paradox is flawed. That's kind of his, you know, his big thing is, you know, we, we can't spatialize time. And that's kind of exactly what Zeno's paradox does. So I think, yeah, it's kind of like the, so the criminal guy, read whatever he do say like oh don't worry like i'll figure it out but yeah i think i think it is pretty clever that he he, he gives like okay give me a let's instead next time let's do this other labyrinth that you know is xena's paradox this infinite you know divisibility infinite regress but then it's uh i still i think there's um and uh, I don't even really know what I was going to say there, but basically I think this story is still, it, yeah, he's still presenting it as like, they're still falling into the, these tropes of the detective is still intellectualizing this and basically giving it as like, Oh, this possibility would be interesting. And then the other guy's like, well, don't worry. Like in reality, I'll, I'll get to the end point and kill you also in that scenario as well. And it, it's almost like a, you know, there's so much uh, significance placed on the, the symbol of the mirrors. It's almost like their little hypothetical situation at the very end is a kind of mirror of the situation, the, the larger situation, in the story itself, where they construct, you know, the, the perfect uh, rhomboid or whatever. Rombulus or whatever that is. Yeah, I'm I'm bad at geometry. I'm like I'm really tired today. That's why I I'm just like really scatterbrained. Oh well, I, I'm def I'm caught in the labyrinth. I think that's the problem. So, uh, Sean, a completely unrelated question. Should I? I was looking at, my, at Netflix. Should I watch Full Alchemist before I or for Full Metal Alchemist before the Brotherhood one? So they're basically they are the same story of about two, i would say two-thirds of the way through their plots diverge and the reason why they're based off the same original media but um uh it was basically there was a written version of the manga and while they were making the show they basically they hadn't finished the manga so the last few uh -oh. theories were not so they just wrote their own conclusion to the show so that's what full metal alchemist is it's not like a they're very simple. I actually, this is, the, this is too complicated an instruction to give someone. So this is why I've stopped doing it. But I will actually say, I really love the way in, in just the plain Full Metal Alchemist one, the way that they do the first, uh, I think it's like two episodes in that one. Like I like it better than the way that they do it in Brotherhood. But I like the story overall in Brotherhood. So I just tell people to watch Brotherhood. I think it has a better conclusion. Um, but it, But watching the first two of the of the like one. if you if you wanted to do that if you wanted to just watch like the first two episodes of of the regular one and then jump over to brotherhood and skip like the first like three episodes i think because uh, they don't line up perfectly they they spend a lot longer in um uh oh god what's the name of that city um 
anyway, there's this city and they they spend like two episodes uh, in it in uh, Full Metal Alchemist, but they spend just one episode in it in Brotherhood and it's it's weird. Um, but um, if you want to hop over, you can do that. But if I right, if you just want to do just watch Brotherhood, it's it's really good. Um, I find the first episodes a little bit slow, um, and then it kind of picks up from there. I would, in particular, the second episode is is um, really good and really interesting. Uh, if you want another anime suggestion, I really like uh, Neon Genesis Evangelion. That I really on Netflix. like Neon Genesis Evangelion. It is on Netflix, and they have the end of Evangelion and everything on there. It, yeah, that which one is yeah, really incredible. That one is, I feel, a much tougher recommendation for I'm trying to because I feel like uh with Full Metal Alchemist I'm like trying to show you I think this is one that you'll be able to follow pretty well it'll make sense (laughs) yeah okay right like Neon Genesis Evangelion is like if you're if you're a hardcore Freudian you're probably gonna love it and otherwise you're gonna be scratching your head like I really like it but like I was scratching my head and I'm used to anime yeah um because I I like things that make me scratch my head so i, I do too yeah, I, mean, right? and I, I mean i figure we all probably do but yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I would say that reading more hiss i mean right and it's <laughs> making us scratch our heads a little bit i would say that would be a good second one if you decide that you like uh a full, full metal alchemist to, to go on to a neon uh uh neon genesis evangelion uh a, if you want to go like insane like if you if you if you want like something that I think is really, really good, but like you probably will not understand without some background with anime, um, Kill a Kill, um, which I believe is on Netflix, um, is uh, uh, it's K I L L A K I L Kill a Kill. It's really good. It is basically almost entirely predicated on the assumption that you understand anime tropes. Because the show is basically just like we are going to take anime tropes and put them into what I think is a really cool story, but just play them uh, like ironically. Um, and but it's it, it's really good, interesting science fiction, dystopian. There are references. There are a huge number of references to um, uh, nineteen eighty four and to Animal Farm. Um, uh, like one of the main uh, characters has this whole rant about, um, uh, she, she calls the subjects of this town uh, and, and the school, uh, you know, pigs in human clothing. Um, she talks about how, you know, uh, uh, f- you know, slavery is freedom and stuff like that. It's, it's very interesting. It's, it has interesting references. It has references you will get, um, but it also has a lot of references that you probably will not get. Like they have a whole thing where like for several episodes, they just are constantly referencing Nazi Germany and you're like, why are they constantly referencing Nazi Germany? Why do they keep talking about this? <laughs> and it has plot relevance. <laughs> um, but anyways, yeah. Uh, so those, those would be my, I would say start with, with um, Full Metal Alchemist Brotherhood. Then if you like that, do Neon Genesis Evangelion. And then if you like that, try Kill a Kill and see if you like it. And, um, so that, that should cover you right for the rest of quarantine. I've, I've just, <laughs> right. <laughs> So uh, any last comments before we sign off? Nope. Okay, well, thanks again. And stay healthy. Unless you go. Bye-bye. See you. Peace.